So, Tim, I would like to give you the floor for your first uh, presentation. So, go ahead. You have the floor. Thank you, Carlos. Um, so, as you said, I am. Uh, I spend most of my time these days writing for Ars Technica, which is a tech website in the United States where I write a lot about patent and copyright type issues. And I'd like to talk today about copyright reform on the American right. So I'll be talking a fair amount about the Stop Online Piracy Act and the Protect IP Act, but I assume you guys are familiar with the basic story there. I think there was a lot of you know, coverage of that. So I want to get into a little bit more detail about um, about the, the sort of conservative aspect to this. Um, so if, if you think about the uh, basic uh, argument for copyright reform, um, I think more often than not it would be associated with the American left. Um, people like Larry Lessig, you know, he's a liberal law professor, he supported Barack Obama for president. Um, and, uh, but not, not everyone who is in favor of copyright reform necessarily comes from the right. So this is uh, Ron Paul who is a uh, Republican uh, candidate for president in 2012, uh, he competed for the nomination. Um, and so when the, the Stop Online Piracy Act was under discussion um, in uh, 2011, uh, he, Ron Paul joined a letter in November of 2011 with nine Democrats. So at this point it was still, um, the, 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 the opposition was fairly small and um, it was mostly Democrats. But he signed on to a letter expressing some concerns um, about it. Uh, and this is Daryl Issa, he was another uh, early opponent of the Stop Online Piracy Act, he chairs the uh, House Government Oversight and uh, House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, um, and he said in, in November of 2011, I think it's way too extreme speaking about SOPA, and infringes on too many areas that our leadership will know is simply too dangerous to do in its current form. Um, so. Uh, I think one of the key uh, factors in building support or opposition to, to SOPA and PIPA um, was the role of think tanks. So I, I've uh, done some work for the Cato Institute. I mean, we've actually been uh, writing about copyright reform for quite a while. Um, and a couple of other libertarian think tanks, the Competitive Enterprise Institute and the Mercatus Center was also uh, writing about this. But probably the most important um, institution is the Heritage Foundation, which is not traditionally um, focused on these issues. Um, but they wrote uh, a blog post um, opposing the Stop Online Piracy Act. Um, and the Heritage is a conservative rather than libertarian think tank, and it, it's pretty close to the Republicans. So um, I think they had uh, quite a bit of influence. Um, this is Eric Erickson. He is a blogger for a site called redstate.com in the United States. Um, the, the, we talk about states to vote for Republicans as red states and uh, states that vote for Democrats are blue states. So he's created a blog called redstate.com. He's a, a conservative activist. Um, and in December of 2011, uh, he wrote the following. Um, this is uh, Representative Marsha Blackburn. Um, and he said, I love Marsha Blackburn. She is a delightful lady and a solidly conservative member of Congress. And I am pledging right now that I will do everything in my power to defeat her in the 2012 re-election bid. Um, and the reason he said this, of course, is that um, she was a, a leading uh, sponsor of, of the Stop Online Piracy Act. Um, and uh, Erickson's proposal was that, that he would try to defeat uh, Representative Blackburn, and he was hoping that uh, Democrats would pick, who opposed SOPA, would pick a corresponding member of the Democratic Party to try to mount a primary challenge to, um, to try to sort of build uh, bipartisan grassroots pressure against the Stop Online Piracy Act. Um, so in January, uh, January 19th, there was the, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, January 19th, there was the, uh, uh, the worldwide protest that we're all familiar with. Um, we at ours were uh, unabashedly opposed to the Stop Online Piracy Act. We actually uh, devoted every article on our site to SOPA the, the day that it happened. I think we ran about a dozen articles about it. Um, and one of the really interesting patterns you saw um, that day, there were um, a, a, a large number of, of members of Congress uh, announced their opposition uh, to, oh, to the legislation that day. And one of the interesting patterns was uh, the, the partisan breakdown. So in the Senate, it was particularly uh, striking. There were 19 members of Congress who announced for the first time they were opposed to the Stop Online Piracy Act. Uh, 16 of them were Republicans and just three of them were Democrats. Um, in the House it wasn't quite so lopsided but you saw the ba same basic pattern. Um, there were 40, uh, more than 40 Republicans that announced opposition and fewer than 20, uh, fewer than 30 Democrats who did so. Um, and the day after the protest there was a, there was the Republican nomination, the, the race for the Republican nomination was still happening. All four Republican candidates for, uh, for the 
presidential nomination said they were opposed to the Stop Online Piracy Act. Um, so it was it was a pretty uh, and I was surprised. I mean, this uh, as I said, it was you know this it's never been a particularly partisan issue, but I would have expected the Democrats to. Uh, to, to be more responsive to these protests, and it turns out that, um, if anything, the Republicans seem to be. Okay, so fast forward to uh, later this year. Um, this is a, 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 a policy brief that was put out by an organization called the Republican Study Committee, which is a, it's a part of the House of Representatives. It represents the more conservative members of the Republican Party in the House. And um, there's very little in this memo that's really going to surprise people in this room. It makes sort of basic point that the copyright system should be uh, designed to uh, benefit uh, consumers rather than uh, copyright holders. Um, and he, he, he suggests some pretty, pretty common sense reforms, uh, shorter copyright terms, uh, less draconian uh, damages for copyright infringement and so forth. Um, but what was really interesting about this memo was less what it says but who was saying it. Um, you have this very conservative organization that um, previously had not focused on this issue um, that was publishing this memo. Um, and I think even more interesting than that is the guy who wrote it. This is um, Derek Hanna. Uh, he's a 24-year-old uh, staffer for the Republican Study Committee. Um, he has uh, some, some background. He's done some programming. Uh, he's, he's told me that he was an uh, avid reader of Ars Technica. And um, so uh, he... he he wrote this memo, it came out on a Friday. Uh, within 24 hours on Saturday, the RSC pulled the memo back down. Um, and the rumor is that uh, there was you know, pressure from uh, content industry lobbyists. Um, and uh, this is David Brooks, who a few days after this occurred, um, he wrote, and the, the election had just occurred, and he wrote an article uh, where he said, the GOP has experienced an epidemic of open-mindedness. Um, talking about the now, now that the Republicans had lost the election, they were much more interested in new ideas. And uh, and David Brooks cited uh, Kana's memo as one example of this. Um, he called Kana a rising star, um, and he he described the memo. Uh, he said it was controversial because it quote differed from the usual lobbyist-driven position on copyright uh, reform. Um, and Brooks was just one of a number of of commentators, including a number of conservatives. I mean, Brooks is another guy who is not really focused on copyright issues. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's significant because 10 years ago, if you'd had a debate about copyright law, a lot of these guys, I think, would have just sort of accepted the status quo. There was a general sense that the copyright system's fine, and the sort of view that I think a lot of people here have was seen as sort of a fringe view. Um, and the fact that people like David Brooks see that as now kind of the common sense view is, I think, a, a, a sign of progress. Um, anyway, so we, we had this, uh, this epidemic of open-mindedness. Um, unfortunately, didn't last all that long. Uh, again, this is Marsha Blackburn, who uh, was rumored to have been be behind um, getting Derek Kana fired uh, within a couple of weeks of the memo uh, being released. Uh, so he's now looking for a job. I actually think he's going to be fine. I mean, it was a, a high enough profile issue, and there's enough people who uh, support what he had to say that I, I'm, I'm optimistic he'll be able to find another job and, and be fine. Um, but I, and I also think that this is a, a you know kind of a temporary setback. I think that um, there's that. The basic ideas are not um, going to go away. So, um, did I? Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, so um, this is a book. Uh, Jared Brito is a friend of mine who works at the Mercatus Center, which I mentioned previously. Um, and he was actually working on this before the, the Derrickana thing happened, um, but it turned out to be excellent timing. Um, so this is a, a book of uh, libertarian and conservative perspectives on copyright reform. I, I contributed a chapter that focuses on the problem of um, criminal, criminal enforcement and, and asset forfeiture, which I think I'll be talking more about at a, a panel uh, on Monday. Um, and one of the really interesting things about this book uh, is that um, it is all uh, sort of right of center um, thinking. And uh, it, I, I think it helps, hopefully, it, it came out a couple of weeks ago. It's uh, gotten, a fair, again, a fair amount of press. Um, and I think it, it, it helps sort of crystallize um, the arguments about copyright that um, really appeal to the right-hand side of the political spectrum, at least in, on the, in the United States. Um, and this is, my, this is Rahan Flam, who wrote uh, one of the uh, chapters with, uh, he's, he's a journalist, and he wrote it with uh, uh, Patrick Ruffini, who is a, a Republican operative. Um, and, and they really stress the theme of crony capitalism. So a lot of Republicans are very upset about, uh, in 2008 and 2009, uh, there was this bailout program where a lot of banks and um, uh, GM, the car company, and some other people got 
a lot of taxpayer money, and conservatives are, are very upset about this. Um, and so they, they sort of frame the copyright debate in the same terms, that basically, the, for example, the retroactive extensions of copyright are this sort of government giveaway to special interests, um, which, which is how conservatives frame a lot of, um, a lot of issues. And so one example of this, there's an, another uh, quote from red, redstate.com, which is a, a popular conservative blog, uh, that a couple after the Derek Conner firing, they, they, they wrote that the RSC is aligning itself with the most extreme perpetual copyright views held by views like the MPAA. Um, so I, I, th I think this framing of, of uh, sort of good government versus you know, special interests uh, getting the government to give them special favors is something that, that really uh, can resonate with conservatives. Um, another really key aspect to this debate, I think, is that the Republican Party really hates Hollywood. So um, conservatives have always hated Hollywood for cultural reasons. They see the sort of cultural med me uh, messages in Hollywood films as uh, not necessarily aligning with their values. Um, but more specifically, they hate, ho hate Hollywood because Hollywood gives a lot of money to Democrats. Um, the Hollywood area, you know, the Los LA area tends to vote for, for Democrats. Um, and so the Republicans really don't see much downside um, to throwing Hollywood under the bus. Um, they're, they're perfectly happy, uh, you know, I mean, they, they don't necessarily have, uh, most Republicans don't have any strong views, but this is something where they don't have any, any sort of vested interest. In contrast to the Democrats, who are getting a lot of donations from, from Hollywood, and so some of them might actually, you know, lose some campaign contributions and some volunteers as a result of this. That's not really a problem for the Republicans. Um, another clear message, I think, is uh, of, of these stories is, is you see this generation gap. Um, I think it's not a coincidence that, that the 24-year-old guy is the one that's writing this memo. Um, Eric Erickson is not as young as, as Derek Kahn is, but he's still, I think he's maybe in his late 30s. Um, but he sort of came of age in the blogging generation. He really understands the internet. And so I think it was intuitively obvious why you know, legislation to censor the internet was a bad idea. Um, whereas older people who haven't, aren't sort of internet natives, um, I think it's harder to explain to them. Um, and so I think that means that the, uh, the demographics are on our side as, as a, a new generation uh, you know, comes up and starts to have an influence. Um, a lot of them are going to be very uh, sympathetic to uh, reformist kind of arguments. Um, the final point I would make uh, is I think there's actually some, could be some benefit from polarization. So uh, generally speaking, I like the fact that tech policy is not an area that's highly partisan. You can be a Democrat or a Republican and um, take you know, either side of the debate. Um, but one of the problems we've had is we've had all of these uh, bipartisan copyright bills that were terrible. Um, and so I think there could actually be some value if you have at least one party that's on the other side of that debate and prevents any new legislation from being passed. I think in the short run, most of the legislation that's likely to pass would be bad. And so uh, getting Republicans invested in, uh, in sort of stopping the Hollywood agenda, I think, could uh, be, be a, a positive thing.